Welcome. I think our live has just started. Uh, so yeah, hi, welcome. Uh, thank you very much for joining me tonight. Uh, for uh, the people who don't know my work, my name is Sandra. I'm a potter behind a brand that I call uh, the Pottery Parade. Um, and tonight I'm going to be making a jewelry dish with you. Before I do that, let me just uh, introduce my work very quickly. Uh, you're already seeing some of it on the screen right here. Uh, as you can probably tell, I like to create work with lots of patterns, lots of colors. And uh, one thing that mostly all of my work has in common is that I like to create stuff that has faces on it. Um, as will be the case with the jewelry dish that we are creating tonight. Um, obviously, there is a lot to tell about ceramics. Um, but we only have a little bit of time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you step by step how I create the dish myself. And I hope this mostly gives you some inspiration and, uh, you know, some motivation to start creating a dish yourself. Um, and most of all, I just want you to have fun with this. Um, so let's get started. Before I actually start making the dish, I wanna introduce to you the materials that we will be working with. So I'm going to put my screen down so you can have a look with me. Obviously the question that I have been having a lot is clay and firing your pieces. If you are working with actual clay, so say stoneware clay, earthenware clay, um, you would have to fire your piece in a ceramic kiln. Obviously, um, I guess that the chance you have that at home is very little because you would have to uh, fire them on very high temperatures. If you wanna work with this type of clay, something that you could do is visit a studio near you and check whether they fire pieces um, from outside your studio. You can locate a studio nearby by, I don't know, using Google um, and see if that's an option. Um, if you don't want to do that, if you feel that that's too much trouble and you just want to start off by exploring the material a little bit, something that I recommend you to do is using air drying clay. Air drying clay obviously isn't the same as this type of clay, but still it gives you pretty nice results. Um, yeah, so those are your options. This is the clay that I have to uh, put in the kiln to be fired. And this is the clay that I'll be working with tonight. If this is a clay you'll be working with too, if you want to decorate the piece, you will be working with a material called underglaze, which is this right here. I have some more colors. I pre-mixed some colors that I will show you um, how I work with them later on. Um, but again, if you're working with air dry clay, you can decorate your piece with uh, regular acrylic paints. I do recommend you to use uh, acrylic paints over other types of paints because in general, uh, like I haven't actually tried them myself, but it's, um, I've heard that that's the best um, type of paint to use on that clay. Um, so let's have a look before we start on the other things that are on my table. Obviously, I have a rolling pin because the first thing that we will do tonight um, or the morning or the afternoon, depending on what location you are on, is roll the clay slab. Um, so we will be using this for that. Myself, I always have a tea towel ready with me because we will be working with water every now and then. I don't think I mentioned it in the material list. It's not necessary, but if you have uh, a tea towel um, near your home or <laughs> in your home, um, just grab it. It's handy. Um, another thing that's good to give some attention is this material right here. It's called clay slip. And basically this is nothing more than clay mixed with a whole bunch of water. You stir it properly and then it becomes this mushy type of, well, slip. That's what it's called. And it's used as glue. This is what we will use to attach a nose to our jewelry dish. So we get back to this later. I also have, let me just move this a little bit. I have a couple of brushes ready, like these rough brushes. I don't use them on my ceramics too often, but I like to mix my underglaze with them. So I've just put them out here to show you. Now these types of brushes, which are often brushes that are a bit smaller, that are a bit softer. These are the ones that I really enjoy working with on my ceramics. Um, Tonight, I'm not gonna use all of these. You're probably gonna see me use this one the most because I love this brush. Um, it's very easy to paint details with this and I'm a lot about details and it still holds a fairly amount of um, underglaze when I work with it. So 
that's nice to have. I have some sculpting tools ready, ready. Not a lot, but these are two of my favorite tools. We will use this pin tool to cut out uh, the clay slab. This is a tool that we will use to sculpt the piece uh, and the nose when we've attached it to the, to the dish. I also have this knife. Um, this is mainly for cutting out your clay. I don't think we will be using it tonight. I just figured I'd put it here, but don't worry if you don't have it. Um, yeah, no, I think that's about it. Oh, one more thing that's good to see is a regular sponge. That's always good to have. Um, a sponge, if you put some water in it and you uh, um, smoothen it out over your jewelry dish, you will see that it's very easy to fix errors uh, or any sculpting errors that you may have uh, uh, put in, in your dish. But I'll get to that later. For now, it's good to know that a sponge is very nice to have. I actually have another sponge. Um, this is one of my uh, favorite sponges on a stick. It's my favorite because it's very easy to smoothen out um, any details that your dish or face or pot may have, such as the nose, um, the mouth, the arms, etc. Don't worry if you don't have it, you can use the regular sponge as well. Um, I think that's about it. So I think we're just going to get started. First thing that we have to do is roll out the clay slab. So like I said, I'm going to use my rolling pin. Gently press, press it into the clay, and I'm going to start rolling. There we go. Now we only need a small slab because the dish we're going to make isn't going to be that big. One thing that's good to know is that when you roll out a piece of clay, and you want to create a clay slab is that when you have a rolling pin to keep it in the middle and then start pressing up from there place it in the middle again and press it down from there because if you go back and forth like this it actually takes longer for you to create the slab because the clay goes to all kinds of places um yeah just do this a little bit more i'm usually not very like specific or keen on, on creating a slab that's even on all sides. I like it when it's a bit playful. So I'm just going to check the thickness now. Just going to roll it a little bit more. Okay. So we now have our slab ready and we're going to cut out the body of our jewelry dish. Um, let me just look at you for a moment. Because what I want to explain is there are several ways that you can actually cut out the dish. Uh, one thing that I like to use is a cookie cutter, because that way I uh, can make sure that they're round. One thing that may be fun to do as well is uh, just use a pin tool and draw out the shape when you're creating it. So it doesn't have to be a cookie cutter. If you don't have a cookie cutter, of course, you can use something like a glass, put it on top of it and draw it out from there. But if you want to go for, I don't know, a bit more of a playful design and you're okay with the shape being a bit less round than I'm, what I'm going to create right now, it's absolutely fine to just draw out a round shape as well. So that's what I'm going to do right now. Back to my table. I have a cookie cutter, a bit bigger than the average size, I think. Put it on my clay, press it, put it up. And here we go. I have a lot of clay left. Um, I wouldn't throw this away. Usually if this happens, something I would do is wrap it up carefully, put it into a bowl, make sure that I wrap it in plastic and I can use it afterwards. For now, I'm just gonna leave it here. We'll actually um, have some use of this later on. And this will leave you with a very round clay slab. Now, obviously this is very wet. There's not something, uh, there's not too much that we can do with this now. We can shape it or we can try, but it's just going to fall down again because it's very wet and it's a bit too flexible to be doing anything with it now. So what you want to do now is wait for your slab to become a state that we call leather hard. Leather hard means that your clay slab is still um, wet, but not as wet as this. So it will still be dark. It will still be cold because it still contains water. 
but at the same time, it's a lot more uh, flexible for movement. So you'll be um, like, it will be easier for you to move the clay into different directions. And how that looks is what I'm going to show you now, because I already prepared some of them um, like this. This is a state that I would call leather hard. I think it's actually a bit before leather hard. You can see it's already a lot firmer than what I have here, which is like, whoop, that's it. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to, first of all, let me remove this. This is the state that your slab will be in once you've waited a little bit. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to gently shape the sides of the dish and I hope that you can see what I'm doing and what happens now let me just do it a bit more what happens now is that you can see that it is slowly becoming or getting more of a bowl shape this is something you have to be careful with because if your clay is already too dry you will see that it gets some cracks and that's not something you want to have happened so well um obviously i like to create like small flat dishes which have like a bowl kind of a round shape at the bottom but i mean it's your project so you can do it any way you want you could also choose to just you know have the surface flat and just you know put the edges up like this for example, there's different things that you can do. Here we go. Um, actually, I don't do this by hand myself. Very quickly, I'm going to show you. I'm not going to demonstrate you, but I just want to show you that myself, I actually, so, hi, I actually use um, this, what is, I think it's called a mold for this. This is not specifically for dishes, but I find this very practical. Usually I put my clay slab inside and I leave it to dry a little bit and then I take it out and I'm going to show you what it looks like afterwards. Now, obviously you can get a mold as well if you want to, or a mold. Um, it's not required at all. You can just also kind of explore your material before you start getting those type of things. But this is... Um, yeah, this is a leather hard dish that comes out of uh, the mall. This is usually what I would start building my jewelry dishes from. So I'm going to start building from here. I'm going to put the computer down again. There we go. I'm removing this one. And I'm going to continue my project from here. First thing that I wanna do is make sure that the sides and the top and the bottom are nice and smooth. And what I can see now is that it's actually quite smooth already. So there's not much corrections that I want to do. Uh, maybe what I could do is just make some scratches in them. Show you what it looks like if, you know, I don't know, if your dish needs some work. Water and sponge, um, it can do magic too with clay. It's very easy to correct errors, like I mentioned. So you just take... A slightly wet sponge and I hope you can see I just put some scratches in there and with a wet sponge I am smoothening out the surface again like this and I see that there's like some uneven here so I'm doing it fixing it with a sponge well I mean it's like it doesn't have to be perfect it's like you can correct this for as much as you want to and if it has some flaws that you like, you can just leave it like that, obviously. It's just so you know that water and a sponge can do a lot to your piece. So now we're going to sculpt the nose. I'm going to use a very tiny bit of the remaining clay. I take a small bowl out of it, just a tiny bit. This is probably already too much. I'm gonna start rolling it between my hands. And then I'm going to place it between my two fingers. I don't even know. <laughs> I know this is called a thumb, but um, I don't know how you call this finger. I'm not, and like English isn't my first language. So some words I, 
I'm not sure how to tell them. Anyway, what you see now is I gently started rolling like the two, my two fingers between the clay and I get this kind of cone shape. I hope that you can see it. And what I do now um, is I cut off the bottom of the shape and then I have this. So you have like this triangle little piece of clay that I wanna attach in my case to the middle of my dish. So I'm just gonna place this here what I'm going to do now is dip this in a bit of water because that's something I do a lot. And then I'm going to scratch. Okay, let me see if I can show it to you like this. I'm going to scratch to make little scratches right here. I do it both ways. So first what I do is I put scratches in there in one direction and then just to make sure I put them in another direction. So you have this spot in the middle of your dish that looks like this. Okay. I'm actually not too sure because there's a lot of light here. So I'm not sure if you can see it well. I'm just gonna place it a little bit more close to the camera. This is what it looks like. Basically, you're putting scratches on the dish because what you want to do is um, you will use the clay slip to have the nose attached to the jewel dish. It will help um, the clay attach better to everything. So I do the same here. I place some scratches. I take a small paintbrush. I take out my clay slip. And I only need to put a little bit on here. And I'm going to press the nose on the dish. Just like this. There we go. Now, as you will notice, clay involves a lot of waiting because this is another moment where you would have to wait a little bit just so that the slip around the nose becomes a bit harder. And that's when you can start sculpting it and start working from there. So now I've placed the nose in the middle on the part that I scratched. I put it like I gently pressed it so that all the sides were attached nicely. I put it away now. Well, luckily I already have um, one prepared where I waited a little bit and the nose is already uh, well attached to the dish. So I'm going to be taking out that dish now. Here you are. So I have another dish. In this case, the nose has already been on there for a while. So I'm removing this one and I'm gonna start working from here. What I'm going to do now is uh, smoothen out all the edges around the nose. I'm going to use this little sculpting tool, this hook that I mentioned earlier. So just kind of press and gently remove the edges around the nose. And then, I mean, something that's good to know is that this is the way that I like to sculpt noses on, um, on my ceramics. But obviously there's lots of ways that you could do this. Um, you could even just sculpt without adding additional clay. There's, there's lots of options. So, you know, just know that this is the way that I like to do it. I take this sponge, the sponge on a stick, dip it in some water. Squeeze well, because I only want some a little bit of water to be on there. And then I gently start to smoothen out the edges around the nose using the edges. And that's why this sponge is still great. Obviously, you can do it with this one as well. Just like this. And that's the first part of the sculpting base. You now have your nose on your dish. Obviously the face isn't ready yet. So the next thing I'll do is start sculpting the eyes. And to do that, I use this same sculpting tool. There's tons of tools you can use. So if you're not sure which to use, you can you know, just get a bunch of them or use whatever you have at home and see what works for you. But for some reason, I've always stick to, to this hook, to this little sculpting tool for, for mostly all of my faces. 
So I'm going to dip it in some water again. I'm actually going to make the sides a bit wetter. See if I can place the dish a bit closer to the camera. And then I place the hook next to the nose like this. I gently press it and then I move upwards just like this. And I hope that you can see that this actually leaves, um, well, an eye-shaped mark in the clay. I'm doing it on the other side now. And that's it. Um, another thing that I like to do is when I feel, for example, that uh, the edges of the eye are a bit too rough, it's, it, it's not very nice looking, like I'm just going to, for example, do this. Another thing you can do to kind of like make it look smoother, make it look like more detailed, is use a slightly wish, uh, <clears throat> a slightly wet paintbrush to make it look smoother. This helps you to remove any sharp edges that your piece may have. There you go. So that was the sculpting face. The face is now ready. This is the moment where if um, you have your piece fired in a kiln, and you work with underglaze, you would have to leave it to dry entirely. Then you would have to um, put it in the kiln for its first firing session. Um, so just remember that if that's what you have to do now is um, when, it dry, when you uh, want it to be dry, to put something on it or to put it upside down just so that it doesn't deform because when the clay is wet, it's still very easy for the clay to, um, to, to change of shape. And you don't want that to happen. With the dishes, it's very easy. You can just put them upside down. So there's pressure on all sides of the edges, just like this. So normally what I would do now is I would leave this dish to dry. I would place it in my kiln. Uh, I would pick it out. And I'm going to show you now what it looks like. I'm going to show you now what it looks like when it's bisfire. Here we go. So this is fresh clay. This is the same clay, only it's bisfired. It's hard. It's still fragile, so you know, don't like take them out of the kiln like this. Probably not a good idea. Um, but it's a lot harder than it was. And the nice thing about this state is that the material more easily allows the underglaze uh, to get into the clay uh, when you start decorating it. So that's because that's why we want our piece to be bisque fired before we start decorating with the glaze. So that's what I'm going to do now. I'm going to remove this one. I'm going to work with the bisque fired piece. It's, I'm not sure if you can see it, but it has a face in the middle. And it's time to take out my underglaze. So I'm just going to put all the colors that I created around me. I won't be using this anymore, so I'm going to remove it. Here we go. I'm going to place my dish here. Let me also remove this. And I don't know if you can see the colors very well. The thing is that um, I usually like to decorate with colors that are slightly pastel colors. So um, they're a lot lighter. And um, I have some green here. That's probably obvious. I have some pink, which is a very soft pink now, but it will be a bit stronger uh, once it's been fired. I have white, I have black, and I have a darker red slash purple, purplish red sort of thing. Um, I use this one and this one for the eye. So I always make sure that I have black and white ready. Um, yeah, so let's just get started. I'm going to start with the eyes. I have a very specific brush that I always use for the eyes. I've been pretty much using it since the beginning. Um, for some reason, it's, it's like the hairs are in a way that it always lets me paint the eyes very nicely. So here we go. Starting off with the whites. Now, these are very tiny details, so this is probably a bit harder for you guys to see. But what I'm doing now is I'm placing some of the white underglaze in the holes that we sculpted. 
and it's we just need to put a little bit there so that's good next thing i'm going to paint is the mouth with my very favorite brush i'm going to use this color for the mouth Here we go. And that's it. Moving on to the pupils. Just cleaning this brush. And what I like about painting eyes, let me just put this a bit closer, is that um i like to paint to paint the pupils on all kinds of sides of the eyes like sometimes i make them look to the right sometimes i make them look to the left sometimes i just make them look centered up down etc i'm going to make them look to the right which is somehow always my favorite side i'm really not sure why here we go so i now have this very tiny face in a jewelry dish no decoration yet but here it is it's just like this tiny cute little face looking to the right no 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 she or he's looking a bit shy um and now it's time for the fun part now it's time to actually start decorating it um i think what i'm going to do is uh paint a nice botanical pattern i've been doing quite a lot of that recently um something with leaves maybe some flowers um, I think the pattern that I'm going to put on it is something that I've um, done before quite frequently, but it's still fairly easy to create. And I hope that gives you a bit of inspiration for when you start painting your own. I'm gonna start off using the green color. Use my favorite brush again. And what I'm going to do is I'm gonna Paint some leaves on two sides of the face. Starting off here, I'm just gonna paint a line. Put, twist my dish to the other side and I do the same here. There we go. And then from there, I'm going to start painting the leaves. Let me see. I'm going to start on this side. Now, this process usually takes a bit longer, as you may imagine, but I'm going to try and be nice and quick. What I like about painting leaves is that, um, I mean, what I'm doing now is, is quite repetitive, like I'm painting a leaf, another leaf, but you can still be very playful with it. So you don't have to paint all the leaves exactly in the same size, making them all face the same direction. It's not necessary at all. It's actually a lot more playful when you, um, I don't know, when you create a pattern that has, you know, lots of silliness in it, I think. Usually when you uh, work with underglaze, you can paint from, well, also depending on the type of underglaze you're using, but you can paint from one up to three layers on your dish. Um, of course, we'll only be painting one today because otherwise this is going to take too long. But this is always good to keep in mind because um, depending on the color you use, this will also um, help you decide on the intensity of your color. So suppose that I would stick to, um, with the brand that I'm working on now, suppose that I use the color pink. I know that the color pink usually needs a layer extra when I paint something. Um, so I would paint two, from two up to three layers of pink on my pattern. The green usually covers well from my experience. So that's nice, I think. Even if I would leave it like this after this session and I would uh, place it in the kiln and have it fired for the second time, it would still be very visible. The thing is that if you fire ceramics, the, the temperatures that they're firing on, depending on the material you're working with, are incredibly high. So there's um, 
there's so much that can happen to your material. I think the first time that I, um, you know, that I, when I um, was taking a course at Noten Schwarz Studio, where I'm actually still taking courses today, when I got my first things out of a kiln there, I was so surprised about how much had changed about my piece. And I was pleasantly surprised as well, because it, it's, it's really cool. It's a nice process, I think. Then again, the nice thing about underglaze, different from, you know, lots of other regular glazes, is that it usually sticks um, to its place very well when it's fired, as long as you don't fire it on temperatures that are too high. So that's nice. That's um, That way you can easily draw on it, draw patterns on it. We're almost there. There we go. Last one. That's it. You notice how when I apply the color, uh, when it's still wet, it's still very dark. Uh, then when it becomes drier, you see that the color um, is slightly fading. That happens to underglaze when you dry it. Uh, but when it's fired, the colors will come out intense again. So it doesn't remain like this. The colors will actually be brighter when they come out of the kiln, just so you know. That's it. I uh, placed the leaves. What I want to do now is include some, uh, some flowers. I'm going to use like a soft pink. I'm not even sure if you can see that it's pink, but it's soft pink. And I'm going to include some flowers between the leaves. So I'm going to use my same paintbrush. I'm going to start off here. And the way I do it, I just kind of like include some flower leaves here and there. Like it doesn't have to be um, a pattern type of thing in like, uh, like a prefix arrangement, so you can just kind of play around. Yeah, the thing with this, the, the pink in this case is really light, and again, it's going to come out more intense uh, once this color is fired, but I'm not sure if you can see it very well from home, but I hope that you can. And if not, you can always, like I, I have a lot of pictures of my dishes on, on my website, so. You should be able to find some there. Mm. Yeah, I think that's enough flowers on this side. Let's move to the other side. What I try to do now is to kind of sometimes paint them like straight in front of the other leaves. And sometimes I try to paint them as if they were behind the green leaves. Kind of depending on what I like at that moment. It's, this is like, I mean, I love ceramics. I love working with ceramics and I'm pretty much in love with all parts of the process. But I think decorating is still one of my favorite parts to do. And the nice thing about decorating things that are this small, like jewelry dishes, is that they're, they're only small projects. So this gives me an opportunity to experiment with new patterns a lot. Like it's easier to, you know, to try out a new pattern on a jewelry dish, which is small, which is flat. It's easier to paint than 
um, to, to try it out on a long base, for example, which would be more challenging. So yeah, they're, they're very fun projects. And especially if you just started to explore pottery, I guess it's nice to start off with something like this because the same goes you know, for, 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 for when you're working uh, from home, when you're exploring it for the first time, you get to try different patterns and sizes more easily. So I think this is it. I think we just covered most of the parts with some flowers. I really hope that you can see this. Um, one last thing that I want to do, just to finish it off, is I like to paint polka dots quite a lot. Sometimes I just cover an entire dish or an entire vase with polka dots. In this case, I'm just going to add some details to the flowers to make them stand out a bit more. So I'm just going to clean my brush again. I'm also going to put some water in my glaze. There we go. So what I like about like, this is a soft pink. This is a lot of a darker pink. And I like the contrast that it leaves when I start painting polka dots with these. So here we go. I'm going to use this brush again. And include some polka dots. I feel that doing things like this, polka dots on a botanical patterns, whether you do them on the flowers, on the leaves, or on the background, um, it, it, it can give some uh, depth to a pattern. And trust me, when it comes to painting patterns, I'm still actually, you know, exploring. I'm still learning every day. I still get inspired by so many, um, well, artists that I, I come across that paint the most amazing things. And I just try to take that with me, you know, to as an inspiration for, for when I start painting myself. The one, the downside, I guess, about painting polka dots is that it usually takes a bit longer than the rest because, um, well, because it's polka dots, because you, you know, uh, especially if you want to cover a longer sur or a bigger surface with lots of polka dots, you have to be patient. But I usually try and have that patience because I, I like the result that it leaves on stuff. For some reason, I still, like, even though I try to explore um, um, new patterns all the time, Polka dots is something that always comes back in my designs. There's like um, a certain playfulness that um, polka dots have. It, it can also look very organic if you have polka dots that have different sizes and have some splashes and aren't very even. But we're almost there. Last one. Yeah, I think that's it. Another thing that you could do, I'm not going to do now, but I, I like to do sometimes is like, well, there's not much room near the face right now, but like you can always include like little freckles, um, rosy cheek, stuff like that. There's tons of other things that you can do. But this is the design that we're going to leave it at for now. Um, let me just put this up again. Hi. And I hope that you can see it properly uh, because I noticed that there's a lot of light here. Um, this is the dish that I just created. This is a design that I, I like to create a lot on my dishes. Um, yeah. And well, I hope this just gives you some inspiration to uh, start creating your own dishes. One more thing that's probably nice to know is that usually um, my process is that I would leave this to dry again for at least one to two days because under glaze really needs to be dry because I'll be dipping it in transparent glaze afterwards. 
Um, then I put it in my kill. I have it fired again, and then I'm done. Um, so that's it. That's my process of creating a jewelry dish. I think it's time, uh, I, I just saw that we have about 15 minutes left. So I think it's time to answer some questions. If you have any. I, I'm reading a question right now. Hi, I would like to know if you have some tips for a studio on apartments, like how to clean without mess up the drain. Thanks. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's a good question. Um, I actually worked from home as well for a while. And oh yeah, that could, I remember like my, my place being full of sand and mud um, a lot of the time, especially when I was doing a lot of production. Um, I guess some tips that I have when it comes to, um, like I wouldn't, like if you work with clay and you use water while you're working with clay, don't uh, put it in the drain. Uh, try to filter it, that's an option. Like I don't know the tools of how to filter it, but filter your water before you put it in the drain because there's actually a chance that your, um, uh, um, like the sewage becomes clogged. And you really don't want that because if somebody has to come and say, hey, your sewage is clogged and you have to explain that it's because you put clay there or clay water in there, that's, so try to filter it. Um, I don't know by heart how that's done, but I think it's a fairly easy method uh, to do. As long as you don't have a filter uh, to drain your water, uh, leave it outside. As long as there's not glazes in there, as long as it's only clay, it, it doesn't do any harm. So that, that that's an alternative, I guess. When it comes to the mud and to the dust, um, something that uh, Ralph, one of my teachers, um, suggested to me a while ago is to place a wet towel um, near the door where your studio starts or where the place starts where you start working with clay. Like if you place wet towels near the door, you at least prevent um, the clay from going everywhere and you uh, keep it in the space that you're working from. Other than that, something that I would use to do a lot is just try to keep things as clean as much as possible. Um, you know, give them a wipe when you're done. Um, use like uh, the, the vacuum cleaner often because it, it spreads everywhere. I know it's a, it can be a struggle, but uh, I, I guess if you do those kind of things, it's still it's still definitely worth to work from home. Because I mean, even though it was messy at times, I, I enjoyed it a lot. So I hope that helps. So the question that I'm seeing now is, do you draw your designs before you paint the pieces? Um, I've been asked that before and I really don't. I, I tried that, it wasn't my thing. Usually I actually, I don't design anything beforehand before I even start sculpting them or painting them. Usually my process is I will create a vase or a pot or a dish just like this. Um, then it gets this type of shape, which just kind of, you know, happens when I'm working on it. And then from there, I start deciding which kind of pattern would be nice on it and which kind of face, etc. So um, when it comes to, to the patterns, to the painting that I place on my, um, uh, on, on my things, I don't really have a plan. I usually just kind of start painting, uh, I guess, what feels good at that moment. I hate, uh, yeah, I hope that helps. Yeah, this is a good question. I'm, I'm reading the question, how can you fix a mistake when you're painting the piece? Um, it depends on the type of decoration material that you're using, but I'm going to focus on underglaze, which is uh, what we just worked with. In general, you can clean it with water. Like if you take a sponge and um, put some water on it and start wiping it, it will, the underglaze will disappear. But if you only messed up just a little bit and you want to remove a detail, something that I do is take one of these knives. You know they're nice and sharp, so you should be careful. Um, suppose that I want to fix something from this dish. I take the knife and I just gently scratch the part that I want to erase. And if you scratch it only gently, you will see that it's fairly easy um, to be removed from your piece. Yeah, somebody uh, asked me why I mix the glaze with some water. Um, it depends on the type of underglaze that you work 
with, whether you want to mix it with water. Um, in general, I can say I like my underglaze to be nice and wet because it's more flexible and it's easier to paint. Like if you paint with a material that's very dry, you will see that you don't get nice strokes. It's very hard to paint in detail uh, when, your is a, uh, when your glaze is a bit dry. So I like to have it nice and wet uh, so that it's easier to, to, to um, create proper strokes, to have it... Um, um, which I can show you, to have like uh, small spaces fill up quicker. Uh, just be careful that you don't use too much water, obviously, but I think uh, especially uh, with the type of glaze I'm using here, which is you're supposed to mix this with water, um, it's, it's okay if you include some water in there. The thing with underglaze is that there's um, a lot of underglazes out there these days. And the type that I'm working with, I can... Let me show you real quick. I'll be back. The type of underglaze I work with is from Keramikos and it's a powder. So I mix this with water um, and then it becomes brushable. And that way, if I feel that it gets too dry, it's, it's fairly easy for me to just add a bit more water. There's a lot of underglazes as well that already are wet. And you'll probably have the need, or you won't have as much need to, to add water with them because they'll be very like fluid, liquid. But here I'm always careful to, um, you know, to see that I, uh, my glaze is wet enough to paint comfortably with. So I guess uh, this is a long story. The thing is, um, my recommendation would be just to, depending on the type of underglaze that you purchase, just check the description carefully. Uh, to see what instructions it gives you um, when it comes to painting. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, is there any way to do this if you can fire the piece? We, we briefly talked about it at the beginning um, and this is probably good to, to emphasize once more. There is a way to do this without uh, firing your piece. And that's by using air dry clay. Uh, I think I tried it once. It's a type of clay that has, or at least the one that I had, it's a type of clay that has uh, a bit of paper mixed with it. So it gets, uh, it's like it, it stays firmer and it's uh, it dries faster. Um, obviously the, the results aren't the same. And I guess the quality is a bit less than regular clay that gets fired on high temperatures. But the thing is, if you're making a decorative piece, I think you should be fine, especially when you, you start exploring with things and you're just kind of, you know, figuring out what you'd like to do with ceramics. Uh, air drying clay um, is a good option. I think if you go to Google and you Google air, I think it's air dry clay, uh, you should be able to find a lot of results. And don't forget that it's something that you can uh, decorate the best with acrylics paints. Um, I have a question here that says, when working in bigger pieces, do you prefer to work with your hands or you'd rather use tools? Um, it depends. I'm, I'm not sure if you're talking about sculpting the piece or decorating the piece. I guess when it comes to sculpting, well, I usually uh, um, sculpt with my hands a lot, but when it comes to the process, uh, of like attaching a nose, of maybe sometimes attach ears, sculpt the mouth, etc. I do like you to use the same tools. Um, I just keep in mind that it's a bigger project. Um, usually when you sculpt something that's bigger, it's also easier. But in general, I do like to use the same tools. And the same goes for painting. Um, obviously, I like to use brushes that are bigger so that it goes a bit faster. Uh, but I still would have uh, like the same tools with me to, to go through the process. I hope that's helpful. I get a question saying, do you mix the Oxida for the brushwork with some glaze too? I don't. It, it, like. Again, it depends on the type of underglaze um, you're using. I do use, uh, use PHT, which is a liquid substance that is, I'm gonna show you.
Tehatin is a substance that makes your uh, underglaze more brushable. But further than that, I don't use any um, additional material at all. Um, besides underglaze, I, I, I work with clay slip. And I've worked with clay slip quite a lot, but um, not with oxy. I get the question saying where I find inspiration, uh, which is a nice question. Um, before this, I was um, uh, working on a blog uh, called Artistic Moods a lot. I, I wrote about illustrators that I whose work I found on the internet or, or in galleries. And I loved art. I, I shared a lot of it. Uh, I, I wrote about them on my blog and they've always been, I guess, my biggest inspiration. And um, like up until this day, some of the artists that I discovered back then are still some of my biggest inspiration now. And that's nice because back then I wasn't creating stuff myself, um, but I've always admired them. And in some way, I hope um, like my way, my, my work kind of expresses um, the love that I felt for these artists work. Uh, other than that, I do get inspired by nature a lot. I find myself sometimes wondering what kind of uh, pattern I want to draw on uh, a dish or on a face. And then I just look around in my studio or depending on where I am and I, I look at my plants or I look at the structure of something that I see lying or I look outside or um, stuff like this because um, because nature is so, you know, it's, it's, it's organic, um, really inspires me as well. So I guess it's both art and illustration, like um, creations of people that I admire as nature, uh, organicness, leaves, plants, stuff like that. My favorite color combination uh, is probably the color combination of my uh, the wallpaper that you see behind me. Um, it's red, no, sorry, it's pink. And green, pink and green, I, I feel um, can be very vibrant. They're actually uh, quite contrasting the colors, but I don't know. Uh, you'll find a lot of my work has pink. Sometimes it's a bit lighter, sometimes it's a bit darker, and the same goes for green. Uh, preferably like ten different shades of green. Uh, yeah, but I do use other colors as well. Like I've actually recently told myself that I should explore different colors as well to just kind of get out of my comfort zone. But yeah. When it comes to favorite colors, it's probably pink and green. I have a question saying, how long have you been working with clay and what other media do you prefer or like to work with? Um, I, have, I haven't actually been working for clay that long or relatively short. I think I started working with clay three to four years ago. I took a ceramics course at um, yeah, the place that I mentioned, Noten Swarth Studio. Uh, I still take courses there today. Uh, I did, however, like start working with clay a lot, quite immediately. Like I, I would go there every day and start making things at home, etc. But my, my career with clay itself is actually quite young, meaning that you know I, I'm still learning a lot myself. I'm, I'm, I'm learning new stuff almost every day and, and, and it, it keeps it exciting for me. Um, what other media I prefer to work with? Um, recently, I've been trying to push myself into painting again more. I used to uh, paint, like I wasn't, I didn't paint a lot, but I, I love like just, you know, to, to, to um, be in my own space and uh, paint a lot. And then what I like to do most is paint patterns and all kinds of weird organic structures and then create um, collages out of them. Um, and that's something that I, I really want to start doing again more. So besides clay, it's, it's paint and then uh, collages, um, as in like cutting out the paper sheets that I painted, creating like strange figures and then making them into collages. I hope that makes sense. Maybe I should show it, I don't have it here. Uh, do I? No, I don't think I do. Sorry. It's it's collages, it's paper and paints uh, and clay. Oh, 
Okay. Um, we have reached the end of the course. Uh, I just got a heads up that the hour is already over. Um, there's so much to say about ceramics. I really hope it's hard to just stick everything in an hour. Um, if you want to know more, I have a course from Domestica coming out really soon. We won't be making jewelry dishes. We'll be making something a bit bigger. I actually have it here. In the Domestica course, I'm making cuddling butt faces, which are these. Like I have single butt faces, which are these. And in the course, we will be making one or two that are attached together. This is actually the final project of the course. So I figured it would be nice to show you. Um, obviously, in the course, I will be talking about clay and ceramics in general a bit more extensive. Um, I think it's coming out within a week or so. I'm very excited. Uh, so yeah, just so you know, you can, you can always find me there. Um, it's been a real pleasure to be here with you tonight. I had never done a live session before and I was a bit nervous, um, but it's been a lot of fun. I hope uh, it has brought something to you too. I hope it inspired you, uh, triggered you to do a bit more with ceramics. Um, and that's it for now. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. I'll be showing you guys how to finish this mask 